Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us at Corporate Connect. My name is Zach. I'll be your MC for this evening. Just like to take this opportunity to welcome Cromwell European Read for joining us tonight, as well as our audience from Facebook Live. This webinar is organized by SIAS and supported by SGX Group. We will kick off today's webinar with a presentation by Mr. Jeff Howey, market strategist from SGX Group, on recent market highlights, followed by the corporate presentation by Mr. Simon Gehring, Chief Executive Officer, Chromia European Read, and we will end off with a Q&A session. Now, just a little quick background about CE Read. It is Singapore's first and largest Read to have 100% European commercial real estate portfolio. CE Read's 2.3 billion euro dollars portfolio comprises more than 110 predominantly freehold properties in or close to major gateway cities in the Netherlands, Italy, France, Poland, Germany, Finland, Denmark, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, and United Kingdom with an aggregate netable area of approximately 2 million square meters and over 800 tenant customers. Now, I'll not go into further details as later we have the CEO to share on the company's business performance and updates. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Mr. Jeff Howey, market strategist from SGX Group, to give us an overview on the recent market outlook. Over to you, Jeff. Hey, Zach, thank you very much. Uh, just a quick disclaimer, tonight's uh, educational presentation, as they have been for the last few weeks and will continue to be. <clears throat> uh, as, as, uh, as we've mentioned in recent weeks, REITs are still actively traded on Singapore Exchange. Every, they account for almost 20 cents in every dollar that goes to work in the stock market every single day here and at the same time represent some 12% of the overall total market value of all stocks listed here. Over the past uh, 10 years, the compound annual growth rate of the REIT sector has grown at a rate of 7%, uh, and that brings that FTSE REIT index to a 10-year return near 70%. Our comparative performances to the FTSE EPRNA REIT developed index uh, is quite similar. That FTSE Epronari developed index, it tracks the performance of real estate companies across the globe. This is really the global REIT benchmark and is comprised of something like 370 constituents of which 300 actually represent the global REIT sector. And placement in this index is of course, highly coveted by global REITs due to the span of passive institutional investors that do track the index. From the end of 2019, so pre-COVID through to last week or through to today, I should say, um, that index has declined by 22% in price and reinvested dividend distributions reduced that decline in total return to around 10% in Singapore dollar terms. That's the FTSE Epronari Developed Index since the end of 2019. And the trailing 12-month yield of the index is around 4.2%. At the same time, our iEdge S REIT index, which is comprised of uh, 35 constituents, maintains a higher 6% yield. And from the end of 2019 through to today, that iEdge S REIT index has declined 25% in price, but the reinvested dividend distributions reduced the decline in total return to 7% in Singapore dollar terms. So fairly close, we've, we've, we've been 3% more defensive than the global benchmark. The total returns, while they are comparable with that 3% difference, there's also been some directional correlation, but there's not a high significant amount of correlation because we've seen very different uh, economic expansions and contractions and COVID have a different measured effects on different economies and different containment measures in place, for instance, um, and different domestic drivers and so forth in, in across the world over the last three and a half years. So uh, we saw the IHS REIT index underperform the FTSE Epronari developed index by as much as 24 percentage points back in 2021. But then in 2022, it posted 13 percentage points less declines than the FTSE Epronari developed index. And this year, there's been more similarity in returns uh, with the year-to-date returns for the IHS REIT index at a 1% gain uh, versus a 1.5% gain for the FTSE Epronari developed index. So performance is uh, mixed 
in the constituents though, and that's obviously down to a number of uh, key layers of diversity, whether it's financial metrics, gearing ratios, um, the is, is so many differential, uh, I guess, layers that you can apply uh, of diversity to the REIT sector. They're diversified first and foremost by where in the world they invest. In Singapore, as many as 17 trusts exclusively invest in property assets outside of Singapore and 20 of the trusts invest in properties in both Singapore and outside Singapore. And then we just have the remaining three remaining uh, exclusively investing in Singapore. So with the international uh, reach, you've got 14 trusts with properties in Australia. You have 11 trusts with properties in China, 11 trusts with properties in Japan, nine um, trusts with properties in the US. Cromwell European REIT invests across Europe and the minimum portfolio weighting is at least 75% to Western Europe. And looking across the broader S-REIT sector, 80% of the trusts own and manage overseas assets from across the Asia Pacific, the United States, as well as Europe. S-REITs are now definitely one of the world's most international markets for REITs. Um, but at the same time, the assets under management of the S-REIT sector is uh, quite largely weighted to Singapore and recovery momentum is obviously a key driver for the sector's pickup. I think in the second quarter, Singapore's real estate sector was growing quite well. It grew by 12% year on year. Um, that followed a 7% expansion in the first quarter of this year and has been supported by private residential property, commercial office, as well as industrial space segments here in Singapore. And for local property assets, Singapore tourism activities also continued to poise to recover into next year. Um, so not just by country, but also the S-REIT sector is well diversified by the type of properties in the portfolios. Diversified S-REITs now make up the largest sub-segment of the sector. You have nine diversified trusts in the S-REIT sector now that make up around 40% of the total S-REIT day-to-day turnover. Cromwell European REIT also maintains, um, I think it's a, a minimum portfolio weighting to at least 75% to the light industrial warehouse logistics and office sectors. Uh, you may have seen Simon, who's going to be speaking very shortly on CNBC a couple of weeks ago, and he was reiterating that how the positive impact of Cromwell European's REIT's pivot to logistics just before COVID had impacted the, the REIT. Uh, but all in all, geographical mix and multi-asset portfolios do allow all the REIT managers to diversify risks across industries, um, customers and currencies when they decide to take that geographical mix and multi-asset portfolio type of approach. So the 40, um, the 40 REITs and property trusts of the S-REIT sector that are actively trading, they uh, ended July with an, active, with an average, I should say, average gearing ratio of 37.9% below the regulatory limit of 50% if, of course, the minimum interest coverage ratio is at least two and a half times. The average yield of the majority of the 40 S-REITs was at 7.8%. Cromwell European REIT's indicative yield is in the vicinity of 10%, while the REIT also booked year-on-year -year net property income growth of 3.9% for the first half of this year on the like-to-like -like basis, which Simon will be discussing in detail very soon. But um, getting towards uh, the end of what I wanted to really share was that um, in, in summary, much of the 20 plus years of the success of the S-REITs, it obviously has been attributed to their comparatively high distribution yields, and of course, institutional and retail investor appetite for dividends. Uh, since the end of the 2021 calendar year, the S-REIT sector has booked more than 2 billion Singapore dollars in net retail inflow. And at the same time, we're continuing to productize the sector as well to provide investors with more alternatives uh, to, to effectively manage REIT portfolios. So we've listed now five REIT-focused exchange-traded funds for trading. And those five ETFs, they did see trading turnover advance, something like 20% in July versus June. The SREIT-focused <clears throat> CSOP IHS REIT Leaders Index ETF has led the increase in both 
retail and institutional trading. It's accounted for more than the third of the combined turnover of those five REIT focused ETFs in, in recent uh, six, seven weeks or so. And that's followed on from uh, the combined assets under management of the five REIT focused ETFs reaching at around 875 million SING dollars as of the middle of this year. <clears throat> Should also note that sophisticated SIP qualified investors can also use the IH S REIT leaders index futures uh, in addition to futures that are based on the FTSE EPRA NARIT Asia X Japan REITs index. To, and that allows those investors to take leveraged long positions and leveraged short positions. So the latter short positions, they do serve portfolio managers that are looking to hedge their S REIT exposure in anticipation of market price declines or maybe uncertainty on interest rate outlooks. And assuming a futures price of where it is now around 11, 1100 one single uh, IHS REIT Leaders Index futures contract maintains a notional value of $27,500. So the initial margin requirement to trade these contracts is in the vicinity of $1,210, giving you portfolio moves at around 27,500 uh, exposures, um, exposures to a $27,500 portfolio, if you will. Um, and that's because each 0.3 move is equivalent to 750 Singapore dollars per contract. And also investors that are looking to look at the difference or the outperformance or the underperformance or the price ratio spread of the IHS rate leaders index to the FTSE APRA rate Asia X Japan rates index, they can actually trade the two contracts together taking different positions on one long, one short, or one short, one long, and also receive around 80% in margin offset on those initial margin requirements. And as we said, uh, there could be uncertainty on the rate front. On the rate front, interest rate hikes, they may peak at some point, despite, I guess, what we've seen in that mid-year uptick in advanced economy inflation. Global inflation is still trending lower. Majority expectations are that US Fed funds rate uh, may start seeing cuts in the second quarter of next year, but there are three things to consider and watch for. Uh, the first is that expectations that the Fed uh, funds rate could increase by another 25 basis points before the end of the year. Those expectations have crept up over the past three weeks or so from around 25% to above 50% expectations. So majority expectations are now that one of the three FOMC meetings before 2024 will see one more 25 basis point hike. And also, as long as the US economy can keep growing above 2% year on year, the more the Fed can actually keep rates higher for longer to help root out all those price pressures that have come with all the demand and supply disruptions over the past three and a half years. And as we saw in the US, um, the growth outlook does look quite uh, solid for the third quarter, considering that the second quarter earnings in the US, which are now just about effectively over, you've seen um, for every one stock that missed its earnings, actually two stocks beat earnings. And of course, you've also got the four incoming FOMC voters next year, Tom Barkin, Raphael Bostic, Mary Daly, uh, and Loretta Mester. They are all of the opinion that the inflation in the US, the PCE core deflator, at 4.1% at the moment is still too high. So these are three of the things uh, that can actually um, really be behind some of the market moves that are in this interest rate mega theme that obviously are having an impact across REITs across the world. And as we said, we've got our REITs uh, sector and we're also building products around that for the investors. So I'll finish off right now. And uh, without further ado, we're looking forward to hearing more from uh, from Cromwell European Rate. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I would like to now uh, welcome Mr. Simon Gehring, CEO of C Reed, to take over the session and share with us on their business updates and latest results. For those of you who are with us here, do send in your questions via the QA function below, and the management as well as our moderator will address your questions. Over to you, Simon.
Thank you, Zach, and um, thank you to uh, CS for hosting um, myself on behalf of the Cromwell European REIT. And also thanks to Jeff uh, for his preview. Um, I feel um, I don't necessarily need to now provide the same sort of introduction that we had uh, lined up. Uh, Dimas, uh, if you can um, uh, start the slide pack. Um, but as an introduction, um, we are a REIT that listed in Singapore at the end of 2017 um, in five countries, now in 10 European countries, and double the size of the portfolio to 2.4 billion. It's very substantial in size. It's almost 2 million square metres, uh, 110 assets. That means that it's very diversified. We're not, um, uh, we're not um, heavily weighted to one or two assets or one or two cities. So you'll hear a lot about resilience through this presentation, uh, and that's really borne out um, through 2020, through COVID, where we only uh, lost half a million euros of income during that entire period, over 200 million uh, worth of rent, and we had to give up half a million. Our um, occupancy today is almost at record highs, notwithstanding the slowdown in the global economy. Uh, we're still um, getting close to very much 100% uh, cash collection. So a very strong portfolio, and that'll come through, hopefully, in tonight's presentation. Uh, onto the next page. Um, while there's, you know, a few of us here in Singapore looking at Europe, I think the most important thing for you as investors in the REIT is we have 220 staff uh, across Europe uh, in all of the uh, locations that the REIT has invested in. So we have locals on the ground that are dealing with the local issues, dealing with the local tenants um, from an acquisition or divestment perspective, very much in tune with the local markets. And I think this is really important uh, for investors in Singapore to take comfort that the sponsor here with 28% co-investment in the REIT and with 220 staff in Europe, uh, very much um, aligned with uh, all unit holders. Next page. So from a resilience perspective, two things on this chart I just wanted to draw to your attention. The first on the right-hand side, this is the industry segment of um, our tenant base. Uh, importantly, not one um, sector is greater than a 16% weight across the entire spectrum. So we're not overly weighted to say, for example, the financial services sector or the automobile sector. Um, so that's a very um, significant diversification point. Uh, the second diversification point here is that we, uh, the top 10 tenants account for less than 30% of the total rent roll uh, from a credit perspective, from a bond in investment perspective. So Fitch, for example, uh, provide an investment grade credit rating on this REIT, and in large part, again, it's due to the tenant diversification and the strength of the tenants. We have 94% of our tenants are multinational, government or blue chip, a very large country um, tenants. We, we have um, only a, around 6% would be exposed to the small SMEs, that could be the small coffee shop uh, or the small gym uh, within one of our buildings. And over a 1,000 tenants, um, typically we, we would only have uh, roughly one or two um, issues at any point in time, a, a very wide um, but strong um, group of tenants. On to the next page. One of the things that Cromwell is, is uh, very focused on is the, the governance and the environmental and social impact of our investing. Um, while there's a lot of numbers on this uh, page, uh, what, one of the key points to bring out here is that MSCI, through their ESG rating services, uh, have rated Cromwell European REIT uh, AA, and there's only three REITs in Singapore with that AA rating. So um, uh, it's it's a, a really um, strong endorsement from a strong ESG rating agents uh, around their, their perspective on us. The second aspect here is our very high score in the NUS as, um, Governance and Sustainability Index, placing us as the leading independent manager um, in Singapore, and we continue to rank top three in the GIFT survey. So, so governance is very important for, for us. Now, for those of you that have followed the REIT for some time, um, I just wanted to highlight um, a scorecard for our first half um, summary from our results that we published uh, two weeks ago now. 
Um, we are, as Jeff said, in challenging macro environment conditions. Uh, the first aspect of what that really means is that asset values typically have been declining over the last 12 months as interest rates have increased, funding costs have therefore increased, uh, and therefore cap rates uh, have risen. Um, on the right-hand side, as, um, uh, as a reflection of that um, uh, challenging environment, our portfolio has only declined 3.5%, 3.5% over the last 12 months. So that's a really strong, again, endorsement relative to the much uh, larger declines in value that you've seen in other markets. And that in part reflects the strength of logistics in Europe. So our logistics portfolio actually has an increase in value in the last 12 months. And we are now more than half of our exposure is weighted to logistics. So this is a very important point that we've pivoted in the last three and a half years to this very strong underlying tenant demand high growth sector within real estate throughout Europe. So valuations um, have been fairly robust. That means that our gearing levels are still below 40%, that very important psychological level. That means that we have over a 20% buffer on our valuation or almost half a million euros um, to the MAS limit of 50%. So we know that um, many other REITs are getting closer um, to those limits. Our gearing is actually coming down um, uh, below 40%. In part, it's also due to our divestment program. So in the last 12 months, uh, we've stopped acquiring. Um, we, we haven't seen the value, but importantly, from a share price perspective, we want to give investors confidence that we're not just out there growing for growth sake, but we can actually, at this point in the cycle, we can pivot to divestments to keep our gearing below that 40%. So that's a really um, uh, um, important um, checking level from an execution perspective. A year ago, we said we would divest assets, um, and we've done so with almost 200 million euros worth of assets that we've sold um, in the last couple of months. The second aspect of the sale program is to reinvest into new developments sitting within this portfolio. So I'll spend some time in a minute just talking a little bit more about that other part of the strategy. Unfortunately, a year ago, the world was just coming to the end of living on free debt on um, negative interest rates. And we've had to get used to that very um, sudden um, uh, reversal by the global central banks with interest rates now in Europe up to three and three quarter percent from negative um, just over 12 months ago. So that has played through in our interest expense. So while we've had a high level of hedging for that component that's not hedged, we have taken uh, a near term impact on higher interest expense. Uh, we have taken the opportunity though to have hedged uh, a greater amount uh, before the interest rates got to 3%. Uh, so we're now at 94% hedged. So uh, any interest rate that's increased above 3% uh, and higher over the future uh, for the next uh, two years, we're, we're almost 100% hedged. Why has interest rates gone up? Well, that's in a large part as a reflection of the much higher level of inflation. So why is that important for CREIT? Well, almost all of our leases in Europe have annual inflation indexation. So while, yes, we've had our interest costs go up, we've also had all of our income, all of our leases, most of our leases going up as well. So we've had a, 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 a fair amount of offset to the higher interest cost with higher index inflation. So that's certainly... Um, a, a unique point of difference in our European market as opposed to other markets that Singapore REITs invest in where we get that annual inflation. And obviously since COVID, a lot of discussion around work from home, Europe, um, somewhere between Singapore and the US, we're roughly around 65 to 70% of employees are back in the office. Um, but what nuance has happened, what change has happened um, since COVID is the um, occupiers, the employers, are very much focused on prime grade A buildings. 
So they're prepared to pay a high rent in the city to um, move into stronger, um, higher amenity um, office buildings. Uh, so that's certainly something that we are taking advantage of in a lot of our portfolio, which is in that grey area. Um, those assets, particularly the assets we have in Finland and Poland, which is around 10% of our portfolio, unfortunately, they're in the B and C grade category, lower rent, higher yield, but with that has come higher risk. And so we have seen our occupancy decline in those two um, cities. Um, offset by the very high levels of occupancy still reported in our office portfolios, particularly in the strong um, jurisdictions of, of Milan and the Netherlands. So next page. So we announced a dividend of a distribution of 7.8 cents. Uh, that in, uh, annualizes on today's unit price of a 10.5% yield. So if you buy the units in CREG today, uh, that's providing that uh, distribution yield of uh, that over 10%. The second thing to note is our NAV is 2.3 euros per unit. So again, at the current unit price of 1.45, uh, we're trading with 35% discount to NAV. Now, the industrial and logistic REITs typically trade at their NAV and on yields much closer to 6%. So in part, investors are pricing in a premium for that growth in logistics. And so as we pivot more to being uh, predominantly logistics, uh, the expectation would be that we would be priced less as an office rate and more as a logistics rate. And so I think that's one of the reasons we've been the second best performing REIT in Singapore year to date this year. In part, that reflection of the resilience, also in part reflection of that pivot to logistics and being categorised more as a logistics rate than as an office rate. We're delivering really strong asset management um, uh, statistics for you as investors. Our occupancy is over 95%, our rent reversion is close to 6%. So we're getting not just inflation uh, on our leases, but as leases expire, we're renewing them at 6% higher rent. And that's translating into our net property income growth and in our logistics and industrial um, part of the portfolio in particular, delivering almost 9% like-for-like income growth. And we've talked about the, the debt with gearing below 40% and the investment grade credit rating. Next page. This is a waterfall chart um, comparing the first half distribution uh, last year to the first half distribution of this year. And I just want to take you through a couple of the key um, positive and negative contributors. So firstly, in green, uh, I mentioned that higher net property income. So that, that produced um, growth offset by the um, increase in interest expense that all of the REITs have, have felt. Um, the third, um, more specific to C REIT um, uh, delta in our distribution is we are now undertaking developments of existing assets. So we have two buildings um, currently that are under development. Now, last year, they were income producing. So this year, not income producing. And so that's been about half a cent uh, impact on the distribution. That income will come back uh, when the buildings are completed and they'll come back at even higher levels of net property income. And I'll take you through some more examples. Clearly, as we sell assets, um, there will be a divestment uh, impact. Uh, so as we, we, we lose some of that rent from, from buildings that we sell, uh, that is obviously being used to reinvest into our developments where we would expect when those developments are completed to provide higher levels of NPI. So this is a rent where unit holders will benefit in the short, in the medium to longer term, from undertaking the redevelopments within our portfolio. Next page. So, when we look at our balance sheet, when we look at our capital management, we really have um, dealt with all of our 2023 and 2024 um, uh, debt facilities. We've recently refinancing 330 million euros. Uh, of new loans for the next four to five years. So there's no debt maturing until November 2025. So in the next period of uncertainty, call it six months, 12 months, um, again, we, we, we don't have to worry about 
um, refinancing our debt. So that's something that we've taken care of. And you can see uh, the, the, the hedging for the next two and a half years at, at that 94% level before dropping to 23% in 2026. That's been done deliberately. If we turn to the next page, you'll see the current Eurozone refinancing rate. So this is the three month Eurobor rate. Uh, again, in stark contrast to the first half of 2022 and for the prior three or four years when we were all enjoying benefits of zero uh, interest rates. Um, the market is, is speculating that in the next 12 to 18 months, uh, we'll see around a 200 basis point um, interest reduction. So while the euro ball might be at almost 4%, uh, the European 10-year bonds is at 2.5%. So you do have in Europe an inverted yield curve. Uh, what this means is that we enjoy an interest rate differential to America of almost uh, 200 uh, basis points compared to US 10-year bonds. And obviously in Singapore, where the uh, interest rates are higher than that in Europe. So we provided there some sensitivities, which is, is it's, it's, we're not very sensitive now to uh, interest rate changes in the next couple of years uh, because of our hedging. Uh, next page. I'll stick through this one. This is just provide plenty of headroom on our loan covenants. Um, I know other REITs uh, would spend a lot more time on this as they're getting very close to their covenants. Uh, please take um, that confidence away that we have dealt with a large part of the issues that many of the foreign REITs are uh, currently facing through our asset sales program and the fact that our gearing has over um, half a billion euros worth of headroom um, to those covenants there. Getting into the um, property portfolio um, now, um, just wanted to highlight that if we look at the right-hand side, we've tried to give you an indication as to the portfolio weighting by country. So our largest investment is in the Netherlands. This is a AAA rated um, sovereign. Uh, very strong economy, very diverse um, from tech through to agriculture through to shipping. Uh, it's actually quite a similar um, makeup to, uh, to that of Singapore economy. And then Italy, particularly in North Italy, in Milan in particular, um, in Venice, we have some large um, investments. Uh, and in France, that's typically uh, last mile logistics in Paris, very strong uh, portfolio in, um, in, in France and in Paris. Uh, the weaker markets I've mentioned in the smaller lines in Finland and Poland um, uh, have some uh, impact, but generally um, at, at almost a full house. Next page. Uh, so this is the summary of the high level of occupancy um, going back to listing. So, you know, we, we continue to show that we've been able to drive positive rent reversions, um, roughly around 4 to 5%, currently averaging around 6%, and maintaining that very high level of occupancy at 94%. Um, doing a lot of leases um, and retaining almost three quarters of the tenants. Some tenants that we lose in part because they're expanding and we may not have the space in our portfolio to accompany them in, or in other cases, they may not be able to afford the higher rents because of the very strong market rent growth and new tenants have come in and paid that higher rent. And that's driving that high level of rent conversion. So very strong metrics. So light industrial and logistics, why is this um, a, a, a strong focus? Well, our, our portfolio is running at a 98% occupancy. And with that come very high level of, of uh, rent reversion. So stronger than that in office. Next page. But it's not just our portfolio. So in eight countries, you know, we're pretty much at full um, occupancy. The bottom right-hand chart is the broader market, so not our portfolio, but the broader um, market uh, vacancy statistics. Again, you could throw a blanket over the eight countries, roughly all around 2.5%. The top left-hand chart goes to the high level of take-up uh, of new space, which has driven that rent growth. There are two factors that are driving this growth. The first is the more obvious one, that's the e-commerce drive. And the penetration in e-commerce in Europe uh, is in particular um, lower than that of say the UK uh, or Japan or US. So COVID has accelerated the usage of online shopping. 
um, but we're playing catch up when it comes to uh, um, the other market. So we're still in this maturing phase of e-commerce. Therefore, we're in the higher growth phase of logistic companies, both the 3PL, the delivery companies like UPS and FedEx, as well as the retailers themselves building much larger um, infrastructure around um, e-commerce rather than their own um, bricks and mortar, moving very much into ensuring they have last mile logistics chains um, for that um, service, uh, fasting, fast speed and low cost um, delivery service, which is really important for e-commerce. So that's the first factor that's driving demand. The second factor really started with Brexit and then was accelerated by Trump and globalisation. So this concept of onshoring, this concept of just in case inventory management. So in the old days, pre-COVID, pre-Trump, uh, pre-globalisation um, uh, uh, stresses in the system, uh, we saw um, many companies in Europe um, running just in time inventory, very low inventory and being able to move um, parts in. That's now changed. So structurally, we're seeing a lot of new um, uh, demand for space as companies are protecting um, their inventory, protecting their production facilities. And there isn't a, a bigger example than the semiconductor or chip um, issues that Europe has faced. Uh, with the dramatic impact to the supply of chips into Europe uh, during COVID and in 2021, uh, we saw, for example, the reduction in new motor uh, cars down by 35% uh, because they just couldn't get the chips. So now by 2030, Europe will be able to produce 20% of the world's semiconductors. And so that's, again, a really good example of onshoring. Uh, next page. I want to spend a little bit of time on, on office because uh, unlike other um, foreign countries that uh, have, a, uh, have a struggle in their office markets, uh, in Europe, particularly in the cities that we've invested in, uh, we've been able to get rent reversion um, and we've been able to um, take uh, tenants out of B grade and into A grade. Um, so onto the next page really is a reflection of this trend. So the left-hand side is overall vacancy, so sitting at roughly 9% across all of the cities in Europe, across all grades. The middle chart, the right-hand chart, um, in the smaller um, uh, columns, that really shows the grade A vacancy. So grade A vacancy at 3.5%. Total market at 9, but grade A, 35 uh, Let's go to the next page. So in Europe, as those that have travelled there, it's it, they're older cities. They're, they're not metropolises like we, we know in Singapore or Hong Kong um, or, or many parts of China. Um, so we, we typically only see around 20% of the total office stock, 20% would be classified as grade A that has BREAM certification or ESG or green certification. Yet over 50% of the leases now are targeting at that higher level of office building. Uh, so Seagreep has around 75% of its office portfolio versus the market at only 20%. So we're able to win market share as the employers are looking to move out of um, business parks or secondary location in large cities like Milan or Amsterdam and moving into higher quality assets. So I think that's something that, that, that we, we see more in Europe than we do in other markets, say in the US, where vacancies are at much higher levels of 25 30% and, and not that same demand for moving out of B and into A. Next page. Well, I'm just conscious of time. I'm really keen to get to the questions. Uh, so what is our strategy? Our strategy that we announced uh, a couple of years ago was to pivot to logistics. And then in the last three to four years, we've been working very hard across a number of our assets to be able to get planning permission to be able to convert them either from B grade office to A grade and take advantage of that trend. Or in the case of Park de Doc, which is our 10 hectare site in Paris, uh, to be able to do major redevelopments of these assets. So um, we're looking to future proof this portfolio. So uh, our plan is to drive to a 60% weighting to light industrial and logistics and a 40% weighting to grade A office. How do we get there? We get there through selling B and C grade office assets to fund the growth, as well as to 
undertake some developments to get us there as well. Thanks, much. And these are some examples of what we're doing. Uh, what we, we see on this page here is an office uh, reconversion in Milan. We're about to undertake an office reconversion in Rome. Uh, we've got one of the best buildings in Amsterdam. It's a B-grade building, but it's three buildings away from the Grand Central Station of Amsterdam, um, right on the Grand Canal. Uh, we're in the final um, planning stages for there. And the bottom right-hand um, uh, graphic doesn't give this building uh, justice. This is Parc de Doc. Uh, it's three kilometres uh, from the Champs-Élysées. It's a 12-minute bike ride to Montmartre. Uh, it's last mile logistics. What you can see around it is all of the Olympic facilities that have been introduced, new metro lines, a brand new hospital, uh, thousands of apartments, um, et cetera. So this is in a very much an emerging up and coming um, district of North Paris, very centrally located. And um, it, stay tuned, we're, we're very close to being able to get uh, a substantial redevelopment um, opportunity with the local council. So why investors should think about the positive nature of doing developments, because typically in Singapore, the sponsor would do the development and sell the building back into the REIT. But we now have over 250 uh, euro, um, million euro to a redevelopment opportunity of assets sitting already in CREIT's um, portfolio. We'll be able to generate higher net property income yields than those properties currently provide, and um, we should be able to develop um, at a profit and so therefore the development profit stays within the REIT. And this bottom left-hand chart highlights if you take a 20 or 30 year old building, the net property income um, rent, if you like, is in decline as the building has aged. Then at the end of the lease, uh, we have a, a choice of trying to re-lease it as a B or C grade building, uh, which is very difficult in this market, or we can undertake the upgrade. And so there may be a period of say two years during this upgrade, and then on completion, once we get to the building being fully leased, then we get that major step up in income. And the right-hand chart um, highlights the valuation gain. So again, the property is in decline. We then invest um, capital, and that takes it up to much higher levels. So that would be better lighting system, better lift system, better insulation, much lower um, energy um, uh, consumption and we get that development profit and that stays within the REIT. So we're getting very close to that production stage. So we've been in planning, we've now started production, we're very close to completing our first project. On to the next page. This is the example, this is in Milan. Uh, it's on track to be completed by the end of this year. It's already 70% leased. It's been leased at rents significantly higher today than our feasibility of two years ago. So again, this thesis of higher rent growth for better buildings, that is coming through. And so in February, in our results next year, I'm, I'm really looking forward to being able to um, provide you with the guidance as to how well this building has performed and therefore showcasing the pipeline of future projects that will come behind this one and show you the benefits of undertaking the developments within this portfolio. So in summary, before turning to uh, questions, uh, we have now taken the REIT to more than a 50% um, weighted, weighting to logistics and light industrial, the, the strongest growth um, that we can see in asset classes. We've been able to sell assets at a premium to book value. Our valuation was only moderately impacted by the high cap rates and the high interest. So our NAV is still a very robust 2.3 euro cents per unit. Our gearing has... Uh, remains below 40%, that important psychological barrier, and well below the 50% MAS limit. That's driven in part because of our high level of occupancy. Um, and yes, our DPU ultimately has been impacted by the higher interest expense, but still at today's price is, is showing over a 10% dividend yield. So while the global fundamentals aren't expected to improve over the next 12 months, we still have this, this um, tailwind of inflation indexation on our rents, and we've hedged um, a large part of our debt. So where is the DPU risk at the moment? It's really in this period of production of a couple of buildings that are out of income at the moment while we undertake the developments before they kick in um, in the start of next year. 
So that's really our key priorities for the second half is to continue to drive occupancy, um, uh, drive that rent reversion, drive the NPI growth uh, to offset the um, impact from the rise of interest rates. We will continue to sell assets in part to keep our gearing below the 40%, in part to fund the development, and in part to ensure that we have more future-proofed assets, um, particularly in Europe, where ESG credentials are becoming even more important in buildings. So with that, um, Linda, why don't I hand over to you for more Q&A. So again, thank you for everyone's time. Thank you, Simon, for that informative presentation. We'll now move on to the Q&A session. So just like to remind everyone to submit your questions in the Q&A function below. For Facebook audience, do click on the link to join us on Zoom so that you can post your questions and the panel will try their best to answer as many questions as possible. So I'd like to invite Ms. Linda Hoon, Assistant Honorary Treasurer from SIAS to moderate this session. Over to you, Linda. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Zach. Uh, Simon, thank you for a wonderful presentation. I think several of the questions uh, that were raised pre-presentation as well as uh, during the live uh, question have also been somewhat answered by yourself, but nonetheless, let's power through. So the first question that, that is on uh, everybody's um, who holds a, a REIT or who has you know, an investment in a REIT would normally be keen to know would be given the expectation of at least a 25 plus five basis points hike before the year is up, what would be the potential for DPU growth in light of such rising interest rate environment? Please share your thoughts, Simon. Yeah, so uh, if we go, um, so firstly, 25 basis points makes no difference for us. We're now almost 100% hedged. So for the next two years, um, interest rates could go up substantially more than 25 basis points. It won't have an impact. What will have an impact is uh, if interest rates do go up much more than the 25 basis points, then valuations will fall. I mean, we're not in the right part of the cycle. We're, we're getting close to the end of the cycle, but you know, when we talk about um, growth, we need to temper that with the fact that interest rates are going against growth. The whole reason that we have higher interest rates is the central banks are trying to reduce growth. They're trying to reduce inflation. So uh, we're less impacted now from the rise in interest rates um, on DPU, more of an impact on valuations. Uh, and, and that's why I wanted to get the point across that we have a number of active AEIs or active redevelopments that will any value. So even if the market valuations fall, there's enough um, uh, elements to us adding value. The second part to answering the question is, of course, we're in logistics now. We're majority weighted to logistics, and we're seeing very good income growth because our tenants need more space. So less impact from rising interest rates on dividend but it's more the secondary impact that we, we are still a little bit cautious on. We're still selling some assets. And, and then finally, um, we, we can't, you know, it's up to the market to price our shares. So if our units are trading at 35% discount to, to NAV uh, and, and on such a high dividend yield, it's very difficult for us to raise equity. We haven't raised equity since 2019, yet we've been able to find ways to recycle our own assets and fund our own growth. So our net property income is higher than it was in 2019, yet we haven't raised any equity. We've been able to drive growth through our own recycling program. And I think, you know, we, we, we are incentivized as a management team to grow dividends. We have no asset under management targets in our KPIs. So we're very much aligned with unit holders. Yes, we haven't provided the dividend growth, the distribution growth um, in euros, uh, although this year um, investors that elect to take um, Singapore dollars will get a benefit given the strength in the euro. Um, yes, we're disappointed we haven't delivered the DPU growth that we thought the portfolio could, um, could generate, but it's really the interest cycle that's impacted. It's not the portfolio. The portfolio is holding up really well. Like I said, during COVID, held up very well. Um, during this current 
downturn in economic growth, it's holding up very well. It's only the interest um, expense that has impacted not just us, but everyone. Yeah, great insight, Simon. Well, you talk about AEI. Uh, so could you share also uh, to the extent uh, possible some details and timelines on the ongoing and uh, upcoming AEIs? This was a question fielded by one of our members before the presentation. And, you know, in terms of uh, AEIs, we all know it's basically asset enhancing initiatives. What would be some of it uh, that would be in the pipeline by management? Can yeah. you comment? Yeah, so we, we um, so thank you for the question. We, we've been, um, uh, you know, quite excited over the last 18 months with this development pipeline, this AEI pipeline. Um, it, in Europe, it does take longer to get approvals. So, you know, we're dealing with multiple um, municipalities, with local governments, um, with state governments, um, in the case of uh, Paris, you know, the Parisian government as well. So various layers. So it takes us some time to bring the idea of the AEI to actual getting all of the building permits and the master, master planning in place. So we've been working on this since day one, 2017. But 18 months ago, we got uh, confidence in our pipeline as we were getting very close, uh, in some cases, to, to getting the permits and in other cases, moving through the master plan. So our first major project is now um, uh, in Milan. It will be completed by the end of this year um, in, in an office upgrade. Um, two logistic um, developments, business parks in Czech Republic and Slovakia have recently uh, completed in the last week or two. We're very close to getting those buildings up to being fully leased as well. So, so the, in, in February next year, we'll be able to look back and tell our investors how well we have done with completing these three projects. Um, and so that's that should give investors confidence of our ability to convert these AEIs. The, the teams have been doing this for 20 years in Europe, but for, as a REIT, We've just started to come to the end of our um, production of these three first projects. The next one off the ramp will be a fantastic building in, in Rome. It's uh, 1959 building, so it's very old, but it's only seven blocks from the Colosseum. It's next to a hospital. It's next to one of the largest basilicas. It's in a fantastic position in Rome. Uh, we'll commence that shortly. And then there's another building in Amsterdam, um, which will see us double the size. That's not just an AEI, that's a, a full-scale redevelopment. Uh, and then there's another building in hub support in The Hague, um, home to um, one of Europe's largest um, uh, life insurance companies, National Nederlander. Uh, that is in a fantastic state in terms of a new project that uh, we're currently working with council on getting approvals, final approvals there. So there's a, around 300 million euros of... Uh, of development opportunities without providing um, too much guidance and, you know, the way of making forward-looking statements. Um, typically, developers would be looking for over 20% development profits uh, on their capex, and there's no reason why we couldn't be any different to that. So that's a timeline going out to 2027 um, the, of those assets that I've just spoken about. And then the big one, Park the Dock, uh, this one could be up to, um, this is a 10 hectare site, um, 10 hectares, that could be 200,000 square metres of new um, property being built, combination of logistics, combination of uh, apartments, condominiums, student accommodation, life sciences. We're, we're one year away from being able to um, share in, in more micro detail with investors uh, the exciting plans that we're working with the local authorities and, and uh, that one uh, is, is very exciting, but just maybe a year away from getting um, the approvals. Right. Well, uh, we certainly look forward to it. So uh, before going to the um, trading uh, and the volume of trading, we just want to make a quick comment here. Uh, ask, ask you, Simon, for a quick comment. And this relates to the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict, how does that impact overall the portfolio and how would you think, or if it uh, you know, affects at all um, the overall scheme of things in your plans? Can you comment um, briefly? Yeah, so we have uh, about 15% of the portfolio in Poland and Finland which um, and Slovakia, 
which share the um, border either with Ukraine or Russia. Um, I would say the biggest impact has actually been to our Finnish portfolio. We have about 70 million euros invested in Finland. That's now joined NATO. It's got a 1,300 kilometer um, border with Russia. Uh, foreign investors have become quite nervous in Finland. So um, that, that market, it's a smaller market and um, we've probably taken our biggest valuation uh, decline in that market. In terms of Poland, the economy is going very well. Uh, there's 2 million uh, quite wealthy Ukrainians that have moved into Poland. They've um, got very good jobs. They've still got their businesses running. Um, if you, I was in Warsaw a few months ago. Uh, they view Ukrainians as uh, Singaporeans view people from Hong Kong. There's a substantial migration. There's lack of schools, can't get hotel bookings, can't get restaurant bookings. Warsaw is going um, exceptionally well. Unemployment there at sub 3%. So we hate to talk about profit out of a war, um, but Poland is doing exceptionally well. So that's um, uh, from an economic perspective, that's something to, to unfortunately. Um, okay. I don't like uh, talking about good things out of a war, but we do have some good things. Yeah, good. Uh, it's always good to have a balance. Well, Simon, uh, so, you know, some, some questions are coming online and I think I will just briefly summarize them. They circle around the, area, the topic of liquidity, which is extremely low. Mm -hmm. uh, share price has dropped to 31, has dropped 31% since the beginning of the year. And, and last but not least, it seems to be that the introduction of the dual currency trading has made it worse. So can you comment on each of these subtopics? Yeah, so I don't know who, who, who said we're down 31% uh, here today. We're actually up 12%. Our share price is higher today than it was at the beginning of the year. Plus we've paid over 16 cents of distribution. So we're the second best performing REIT year to date. Sure, last year was not a good year, and that was largely because of the um, impact of inflation and energy crisis. Europe clearly came through last winter in much better shape than people predicted. It's a much shallower um, GDP um, uh, impact to, to the Russian and Ukrainian impact on energy. So I, I, I'd certainly just highlight to, to your viewers that no, we are one of the better performing rates this year. What about the liquidity? Um, well, I think if we were trading 20 or 30 cents higher, then we may see better liquidity at the moment without being flippant. Um, we've lost virtually no major investors. Um, if we think about our institutional um, holdings, about 20%. That's unchanged in 12 months. Uh, the issue is who wants to sell a, a REIT on a 10.5% yield? Plenty of buyers, but there's, there's not a lot of selling. So we're in that, unfortunately, that time of um, the market where, you know, at, at these levels, not much selling. We need to drive the price higher. To drive the price higher... Um, then we need a couple of things to happen. The first one, obviously, is we need to get to so the psyche of the market that the interest rates from the ECB perspective have come to a peak. Uh, and so, therefore, you know, that's a couple of months away. We, um, the market is speculating. So we need a couple more months or quarters on interest rates. And then the second is we need to be able to show that we can provide these um, uh, developments and offset this current dip in DPU as we've taken some assets out of income and we put them back into income next year. Okay. Uh, well, all right. And uh, probably we would just take in two more questions uh, before we close. Uh, the first of the two would be, can you comment on the value add that your shareholders of uh, Seaweed uh, offers to Cromwell? In other words, um, what sort of uh, very tangible value add have you seen, I mean, surely as management, you know, you would be looking at what the shareholders are expecting from management in terms of your performance. But on a very objective basis, do you see that your biggest shareholders uh, of the sponsor ESR group, how do you add, how do they add value to the overall Cromwell, Cromwell uh, context? So firstly, um, uh, Cromwell owns 28% in the REIT. Uh, ESR has zero investment in the REIT. So I'm not sure where, where, where that question came from. 
Um, this, the second aspect is Cromwell provides 220 staff in Europe to support sea route. And by keeping occupancy at 95%, by driving net property income, um, by high levels of rent reversion, uh, we've been able to mostly offset the rise in interest expense. I mean, some of our peers have cut their dividend in this last two weeks by 35%. The average Singapore REIT in the last two weeks cut their dividend by 15%, right? If you take out the impact from our um, deliberate strategy of taking some buildings out for development, our distribution is only impacted by 4%. So from a relative perspective, we've been uh, very active within our portfolio. Our valuation, um, again, has been um, supported by our pivots to logistics, and I think that's something that you know, investors you know, from a big picture, you know, capital allocation, investment strategy um, had benefited from moving into logistics and undertaking these developments, which will start to show that benefit from next year. Thank you. All right. Probably the last question, and I'll combine two questions into one, Simon. First would be, uh, so there's two aspects of this, but they are basically one question. Mm -hmm. Uh, the aspect of, um, okay, so we talk about at the beginning of the Q&A, we talk about the high interest rates and there is an expectation already for a further hike. So it is all basically factored in. Now with the high interest rates expected to last longer, perhaps down into perhaps the second, first or second half of uh, 2024, how is Cromwell positioning itself? And would DPU start to recover once this happens? Therefore, we are looking towards a higher DPU for 2024. Please yeah. comment. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not trying to be I'm not trying to be alarmist in this uh, in this answer, but you know, we haven't seen interest rates go up this much. We haven't seen liquidity from the central banks come down this much globally. Uh, and so this is a period of time, in a, and we've seen this cycle before. Uh, we saw this cycle in 2009, 2010. Um, our, our, the board um, said, you know, a year ago, we need to make sure that we batten down the hatches, that we focus on our balance sheet, that we focus on liquidity. It may come at the slight expense of the distribution impact of a couple of percent, fine, but we need to show that through this late part of the cycle where valuations are falling, banks aren't lending as much and lending at much higher rates. There will be real estate fallouts. We're seeing that in Singapore at the moment. I'm not going to mention which REITs they are, but we are seeing REITs that didn't take that action a year ago, getting themselves into structural difficulties. We were very focused a year ago to batten down the hatches, sell buildings, um, you know, be focused on capital allocation and not make these, these acquisitions, knowing that at this point of the cycle, we could predict what was going to happen. We couldn't predict COVID, that, that came out of left field, um, but, but this point of the interest rate cycle, we know what's going to happen. We've been here before. And so it's very much about focusing on the balance sheet, focusing on liquidity. Distribution growth is secondary at this point in time. What we don't want to do is get into the trouble and the hot water that many of the other REITs are in. We want to take that angst out. When we're trading at a 35% discount to NAV and a 10.5% dividend yield, even if our distribution per unit was to go up half a cent, it's not going to change. 10.5% goes to 11%. Investors won't get rewarded at this point of the cycle whether our distribution is 15 cents or 16 cents. They want to make sure, investors want to make sure when we go around and talk to investors, please stay out of trouble like some of these other REITs. And that's what we're doing. The second part of your question then is, yes, um, when the cycle turns, we've got this development pipeline that starts to kick in. And we've got the, the logistic in particular, and the Grade A office in the Netherlands and in Milan, that will also contribute to income growth. We'll get the benefit of the debt coming down. We'll get the income growth and we'll get the development growth. So batten down the hatches. We've been doing that for 12 months. Do it for the next six to nine months and benefit when the world turns. As it will, we're in a cycle. The cycle will turn. This REIT will be in really good shape to take advantage of that turn. 
with not having to deal with the difficulties that many other REITs, not just in Singapore, but globally are facing. Right. Oh, thank you, Simon. That was a really positive note to end on. And uh, with this, uh, I'd like to tell our participants that uh, we have actually received more than we could swallow. <laughs> so what we would like to uh, inform participants is uh, your questions and all questions that have been sent in would be redirected to Cromwell uh, Investor Relations and they would reach out to the various uh, parties. Uh, well, with this, uh, thank you once again, Simon, and good things are always worth waiting for. So, <laughs> okay, Thanks back to much. you. Okay. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, Simon, for the insightful panel and uh, Q&A session. So, we hope that you have found Corporate Connect um, session informative. In case of any parts of this session that you have missed, you can actually rewatch this webinar, which will upload on CIA's YouTube channel. So Corporate Connect is our monthly webinar. Do visit our website to get more updates on upcoming sessions and investor education programs. The next Corporate Connect will be on 5th of September, featuring Capital Land India Trust. Do also type in the chat box to let us know any listed companies that you would like us to invite on board this webinar. So uh, without uh, any further discussion. Let me just uh, thank everyone for joining us this evening and we hope you can have a good night ahead. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night.